Thank you very much. First of all, I can speak her, I'm very happy to have Yishin Shi. He is a graduate student in theoretical physics uh, under the supervision of Andy Strominger. Our research focuses on uh, rapidly speaking black holes, the current CFT correspondence, and today she will tell us about critical emission for a high spin black hole. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me here. So, today I'm going to tell you about critical emission from a high spin black hole. This is work that we put up on archive on the very last day of 2017. It's done with Alex, who's here, and Achilles, who's a postdoc at UCSB, who used to be an student. So in this work, we analytically compute the broadening of electromagnetic line emission from the innermost region of accretion disks, which surround high-spin black holes. Okay, so here's an overview. I'll first give an introduction, then I'll move to an overview of the near-horizon region of extreme curved black holes, as well as geodesics that originate, no geodesics that originate from that region, and reach a far observer like you and me. And then I'll move to the main part of our talk, um, which is on the line emission from a black hole accretion disk. Everything will be done analytically. And then I'll present a model for a disk which obeys symmetries in the next region. And finally, I'll conclude. So we live in a really exciting time. Now we have an unprecedented amount of data for spinning black holes. Many of you here are working on the Event Horizon Telescope, and in particular, I want to mention XMM New Star, uh, XMM Newton New Star, and SWIFT, for example, etc. Those black holes, uh, sorry, those telescopes, in the past few decades, have really propelled the area of research of iron line. And Laura Brandman, who is at Harvard, is an expert in that field. And in 2013, she wrote a paper where she gave a review of black holes. And here you can see many of these black holes that she gave, which have very high spin. So this is all very exciting. And the situation that we have here is a fast spinning black hole. And around it, we have an equatorial um, accretion disk, which is, we assume to be thin and slowly accreting. And by slowly accreting, I mean that we assume the particles on the disk to follow circular orbits, so we ignore the radio component. So I don't exactly know what the corona is. If anyone knows, please let me know. But what I learned from astrophysicists is that the corona excites atom iron atoms on the accretion disk. And in turn, that, um, the excited iron atoms emit, and that light can be observed by an observer, which is very far from the black hole. So this situation is very complicated. In particular, when doing data analysis, you have to isolate data from contributions directly from the corona, from an intrinsic observer of black holes, galactic observer from the Milky Way, etc. I'm not an expert on this, but the whole situation is complicated. That um, when you want to make a plot of your flux on the y-axis and on the axis, x-axis, if you want to have the observed energy, then as we know, there is line broadening. So our line, uh, emitted iron line is at 6.4 keV, but it's broadened. However, there is noise both at the lower end and the higher end of the spectrum, like our speaker from last week, Aaron Carr, has talk had talked about. So it's a complicated situation. And my question is, is there something that theoretical physicists can do? And the answer is yes. So near the horizon region of a fast spinning black hole, there is enhanced symmetry. And because of that symmetry, we're able to do a few analytic computations which traditionally could not have been done, which were done numerically. For example, Shaha, uh, Achilles, and Andy have worked on computing the radiation emitted from fast plungers into the fast spinning black hole. And that, um, that was done completely analytically. And also Sam, Alex, Maria, and Andy have worked on magnetospheres, which are described by equations of force-free electrodynamics. Again, these equations were very complicated and traditionally were done numerically, but they were able to do it analytically. And in particular, I want to point you to a sister paper that came out last year on um, observational signature of high spin at the Event Horizon Telescope by Sam, um, Alex, and Andy. And in this paper, they consider an isotropically emitting hotspot that orbits the fast spinning black hole. Whereas in the um, paper I'm presenting to you now, we consider a whole accretion disk. 
Okay. So what we do is we analytically compute the broadening of electromagnetic line emission, which originates from the innermost part of an accretion disk that resides in the near horizon region and is observed along the neckline. You might not be familiar with the terminology, but I'll show you a picture of the neckline later. Basically, it is a vertical line segment that's on the observer's screen. And what we find is a universal result. Okay, so I start with a um, brief review of the near horizon extreme curve geometry and the geodesic. In boyle linquist coordinate, the most general curved black hole has symmetry given in the form of 2.1. Notice that I'm using Hatter coordinates for everything because later when I uh, deal with neck coordinates, I'll be using unheaded co um, coordinates. In physics, we simplify life by taking limits. So after um, we can take the extreme curve limit A equal to M and then use Spartan Horowitz coordinate to zoom onto the horizon. So the first R here on the left hand side is assumed to be small. And when you do that, what you're gonna obtain is the neck metric to leading order given by equation 2.3. It's worth noting that compared to the curve metric, the neck metric has two extra conserved quantity. What I'm also going to do is to redefine the conserved angular momentum and conserved Cauda constant to make my equations look better. Okay, now, so back in 1968, Cauda had already um, figured out an integral equations motion that described the geodesic equations in curve. Apart from 2.5, there are two more equations which describe the phi motion and the t motion, but I'm not presenting them here because they're not relevant to this project. But this equation is extremely difficult to solve. So uh, it can be written in Jacobi elliptic functions, and traditionally they are done with using numerics, that is ray tracing method. But the good news is this can actually be solved analytically for emissions that originate in the near horizon region of curved black hole. And then how you do that is to use matched asymptotic expansion, which I will briefly describe. This was first done by Achilles, me, and Andy. So in that coordinate, you can write the denominator r in terms of 2.8, and then this, this equation, this is a very complicated equation, but it can be simplified in both the near region, by near, I mean the near horizon region, and the far region. So in the near region, you have a simple, simpler um, integral to do, which you can do analytically. In the far region, you also have a simpler integral. And you can match the solution to both integration in the matching region. So this method, this method only works to leading order, but we do have a leading order analytic solution to the curve geodesic. And in summary, if you have an emitter in that, such as the R atoms that we're interested in, which are in the near horizon part of the Christian disk, and you have far observers like our telescopes, then solving the geodesic equation will give you an analytic expression. And this will be useful in the next part of my talk. Okay, so now I move to the line emissions from a black hole accretion disk, now computation. Okay, so the profile of line emissions from a disk of matter around a black hole is generally done using the method of geometric optics, first thought of by Bardin and Cunningham in 1972. They define a redshift factor G, which is the observed energy over the emitted energy, and in, um, uh, in her um, coordinates, it's written in 3.1, where Rs hat is the uh, source, so that is the emission point. And what we do is we define impact parameters, alpha and beta, on the observer screen. So alpha and beta parameterize the observer screen, where <coughs> alpha correspond to the phi direction and beta correspond to the theta direction. Do you also include the Doppler effect, because that's separate from redshift? Just due to the motion. Yes, this is just this is just due to the motion. No, the redshift yes. is due to the fact that the <coughs> climb the potential well. But in addition, yes. there is a Doppler effect, which is separate. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, so the 
as you know, if we're in the equator, if the observer is near the equatorial plane of the black hole, then there will be a Doppler effect. But when you're viewing the black hole from head on, that's uh, you cannot oh, so see that. You are just restricting your attention. No, 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 no. That's not true. Okay. We are, yeah, we are considering this. And in fact, there's a lot of complication in this, which I'll describe later. Um, yeah. But this includes. <laughs> What you're calling redshift includes Doppler. Yeah, yeah. It, it does. It does include. Oh, because you've it's the actual. That's right. In fact, we cannot. We cannot. So okay, this is a whole other story. But we cannot see light head on. There is a critical angle theta naught at 47 degrees. If you're below that angle, if we're viewing black hole below that angle, then we cannot see light that originate from an accretion disk that's in the horizon near horizon region and reach the far observer. We cannot see that. There's a restricted angle from which we can see that light. Yep. So is the idea that the rotation curve in the neck region is universal? Uh, sorry, what's universal? The it, it, because there's no velocity term here, right? So is it the there is, there is US. US. Oh, oh yes. sorry, okay. Yeah, I see. That is. So it's not <laughs> just the gravitational range, it's right. also yeah. yeah, this is the um, velocity of particle in the disk. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, then if you have a bunch of geodesics, they're going to subtend a solid angle on the observer's screen, parametrized by alpha and beta. And in particular, we can relate them through two Jacobians, first with uh, lambda and q, which are related to the conserved angular momentum and conserved cutoff constant, and then to rs, the emission point, and g, the redshift factor. When you put all these together, then you, you can write down an expression for the observed flux. F not given by 3.4. The extra ingredient here is the emissivity function. And this, um, traditionally, in most of the astral paper, what they do is to pick a power law or a broken power law to account for that. However, um, we have built, as I'll present in the next part of my talk, we will, um, what we'll do is to find a disk model which complies with neck symmetries. And that symmetry will allow us to fix this um, emissivity to a particular form. One other complication there is gravitational lensing, so you can have orbits that go around many times before this. Yes, yes. So is yes. that included here? Yeah, um, so there are more yeah, there are more complications. We're doing the simplest case. The model that we'll be building is a, really a toy model. But the only thing is it complies with neck symmetry. But you include so, gravitational lensing implicit here. And the fact um, that photons move on Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the, what, what do you mean it's a toy model? I think this is what we're supposed to. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm calling it a toy model. It is a simple model. Okay, I should. Have it's not a toy. toy. <laughs> it's what we see. <laughs> it's a toy model. It's a very strong model. It's not a toy model. Yeah. It's a very straightforward model. It's a toy model. You won't get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. So what we can do is we can we can we as in the curve metric? Yeah, yeah, this so is just you're, the distance. You're, you're assuming that the curve metric is a good approximation from the source all the way to us? No, 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 <laughs> that's, that's not the case. So the curve approximation of, uh, you, do you mean the neck approximation? Well, no. I'm, I, I mean, you're, you're you're using these net coordinates that derive from the curve this coordinates. This is curve coordinate, and that and, and that R is from the curve coordinate. That's right. And this is at us. This is what we're observing. Mm -hmm. So you seem to be assuming that this that this coordinate system is a good approximation from the source all the way to us. Uh, so in in net in net we have net coordinates without the heads. And in curve, like as long as we have a curved black hole in our space time, then we can describe the space time using curved coordinates, which is yeah. But I mean, but but not too far from the black hole, mm -hmm. it doesn't look anything like her. It's going to start looking like FLRW. But there, there are GRs looking for so. Okay. Yeah, in the in the far region, like um, when I describe the method of mesh asymptotic expansion, in the far region, the current metric, uh, I mean, if it, if it comes flat, the current um, effect is not important anymore. Yes. Okay, so the first, uh, the first Jacobian is very easy to compute. You can just do the differentiation. However, the second one is traditionally not computable because of the, our lack of method in solving the geodesic equation, but we did find an analytic expression from it. How we found that was first using matched asymptotic expansion, and second, also taking into account that dominant contribution of, to the flux come from the near, um, from the emission point being at the near region turning point. 
So that's why we can find an analytic expression 3.6, which had never been found before. And because of that, we obtain a universal result given by 3.7. Here, um, beta is a function, an explicit function of g. I'm not writing it just because it's long. So the entire flux is given by an, um, by an explicit analytic function of g. Here, the emissivity, I'm still leaving it aside, but it is a function of r. So you can when you integrate over, it's just, it just gives an overall factor. And what we found is a universal result that's independent of models. So here, I have some plots. This, this, this vanishes outside the interval uh, 1 over square root of 3 to square root of 3, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. plot. Yeah, I was moving to it. Yeah, okay. So first, look at the um, plot on the left. Here we have the black hole shadow, the parameterized um, by alpha and beta on the observer screen. And all emissions from NAC are constrained to appear on what's called the NAC line here, okay? So here's the shadow, and on the right hand side, I have made a plot for this. And this equation, uh, yeah, the plot I made is for three different observation angles. And as Andy just mentioned, uh, here, this value is 1 over square root of 3, and the top value here is square root of 3. It's constrained to appear in between the emissions. Okay, now I'll present the model, which is not a toy model. <laughs> it's a metric model. So, if we have a um, particle number current, uh, we can write down a particle number current. For this, which terminates at ISCO, the expression I write down is given by J, which is rho, the particle number density, the number of emitted density. H is the heavy side function, which fixes the equation is to terminate at ISCO, the innermost circle of it. And the delta function fixes the accretion disk to be at um, in the equatorial plane. And finally, we have the velocity of particles in the disk. Now, if we assume that particles emit isotropically, then the local emissivity at the surface of disk is basically given by this row that I have in my J. The next piece of ingredient is the most important from that. NEC tells us that there is dilation symmetry, which is generated by the killing vector RDR minus TDT. Be because of that dilation symmetry, we know that we must have uniform particle number density per unit proper radial length. And particularly, if you calculate the, part the number of particles, which is given by a spatial slice of sigma mu, which is um, just a normal vector to the uh, spatial slice in the future direction times the square root of um, the induced metric, uh, sigma mu, j mu, and you do the calculation putting all the components, then you see it's proportional to the length of the throat, uh, length of the disk in the neck region. That fixes our emissivity function to be given by 4.4. And if you take the neck limit of this, then to leading order, it's just 1 over m squared. Now, the disk, because the disk lies in the neck region, if you integrate over the whole neck length, then that's going to give you log epsilon, where epsilon is such that uh, epsilon is just a deviation from extremality for any black hole. The choice of epsilon cube is rather arbitrary here, but the reason why we make this choice is because this way we have the ISCO at an um, order epsilon. And uh, you can say that in the extreme curl limit, the exactly extreme curl limit, this really blows up because it's log epsilon. But it's, a, it's the slowest divergence that we can find. For example, if you have a real black hole of A at 0.995 M, then in that, that case correspond to epsilon being 0.1, and log of 0.1 is just 2, so, yeah. And now if I put every piece together, then the observed flux is given as a function of g in 4.6. In particular, this part is model independent, and the log epsilon comes from our symmetric model, which obe obeys the symmetry, the dilation symmetry in that. So what have we done? We have analytically solved node geodesics that connect net and far observers through matched asymptotic expansion. We have found a universal result for the flux F0 that originate from accretion disk in NEC. This is completely independent of model. 
And we have built a model that obey dilation symmetry in that. But what else can we do? One thing we've been considering now, uh, working with Andy, Alex, Dan, and Delayla, is polarizations. So given, say if the light is or initially had already been polarized in the neck region, there is there a way for us to use neck symmetries to figure out the initial polarization configurations and then consider you know gravitational Faraday rotation, etc., and match it to the and then match it out to the neckline and see how the polarization is going to appear on the neckline on the observer screen. That's one thing we're working on. Another thing we're just thinking about is with jets. So we just learned from Michael Johnson recently that jets don't appear as jets until they're quite far from the black holes. But what we're thinking is perhaps inside neck there's some kind of loading mechanism onto jets. So we're still thinking about that. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> what I think about that Yeah, because of the egg. It might help you remember this important regional space time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for So I didn't follow the last bit where you said that you could get a universal emissivity profile. Uh, it's not the emissivity profile that's yeah. universal. The emissivity profile um, is dependent on our model. Okay. But for any model that obeys neck symmetry, it should have the same emissivity. Yeah. I guess that's the statement I don't understand. Uh -huh. what, what exactly are you saying? What's universal? Yeah, what exactly is universal? So this is... The emissivity um, is this thing multiplied by an integral over the integral over emissivity. However, this this factor here is what's universal, and the emissivity just contributes an overall factor. So it's what I'm saying is, that's right. That's okay. A, so g, this f uh, function of f as a function of g is universal. G is like the red shift. shift or redshift. Right? Redshift. That's okay. Right. So this is the part that I'm having difficulty understanding okay. why this should be universal. Because you know this radiation is coming with some you know corona is radiating it. There's all sorts of funny stuff going on there. How can That's you just right. eliminate all that physics and say that finally I just have one function that doesn't care about anything else? Uh, so I'm I'm not considering emission from the corona, but an equatorial accretion disk. And for any emission from that equatorial accretion disk inside neck. This is the result that you you will get. It is a universal result. When you say universal, universal in terms of what? Uh, like, if you vary some parameter, it's universal. That's She's right. saying if you vary I'm, anything, only the coefficient, the normalization yeah. will change. But I'm, the shape will always look exactly like this. I'm saying if you, regardless of the model you're using, uh, for example, there's the Cockthorn model, which is very famous in astro literature. Even for that model, regardless of the, mo the model, the dependence on G will be given in this form. This will be the shape of the iron line curve. Okay, so the shape of the iron line is universal. This, That's what you're this is the shape, yeah. The normalization can be dependent on astrophysics, That's but right. the shape is universal. Yeah. 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 So, so, okay. yeah, so does it match simulations? So we haven't done simulations, well, it must, but... This is the correct result. <laughs> <laughs> If it doesn't match my simulations, yeah. it means we made an error. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not able to understand this yeah. physical I mean, simulations yeah. are wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, but yeah. far be it for me to put any stock in simulations. But. Yeah, but one important point is that we are only considering the portion of accretion that's inside yeah. neck. We know that there's the uh, the accretion that is thick and goes outside of neck. So, so, but, but, but yeah. so, so the, the ISCO, for, mm -hmm. if you're in a high spin case, like A equals 1, then I, th I think in boyer linquist coordinates, everything is at one, 1 RG, right? So you've got the, yeah. the ISCO and the event horizon is all at the same coordinate level, but they're at different. That's right. And they're, and they're infinitely far yeah. away. Exactly, and infinitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah is, in the talk, Alex. This, this is a test of how good your numerical code is. If you can reproduce it. I'm not joking. It's exponentially, <laughs> diff it's exponentially yeah, difficult yeah, yeah. to reproduce this because as you get near this fixed point, you're probably just using a few grid points on, on this region. As you get near the fixed point, fixed point, the physical volume of this region goes to infinity. 
And so your computer will have a very hard time. So uh, you should make a strong <laughs> statement that this is also a test of observ an observatory that claims to see. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so,
<laughs> well, that does raise the question that she was asking. So what is the emission measure in this region? Do you have, a, have you tried to calculate that? In other words, how much stuff is there actually emitting into there? Well, the emission okay. measure is really small. You won't see anything. Right? Well, so, so, that, so that's it. Whether these effects could be big or not, one of the, this divergence is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. So in an idealized world where you have an extreme black hole that has an accretion disk, that goes all the way to the bottom, you actually see an infinite amount of energy coming out. And that's not unphysical because it would take an infinite amount of time to feed. So something will cut this off. Right. But the fact that the leading order approximation gives you an infinite result lends hope to the idea that in the real dirty world, there still so could big. be something. Yeah. You, you could you could scrape out under the dust. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh,